we're going live again in just a couple of days. So it's been a little bit of a short turnaround, but I have some time on my hands for lives now. So I said, let me be prolific with the lives because I'm sure there'll be a point sometime soon where I'm not going to be so prolific. So we're going to get, let people get on. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with, um, we're going to talk about some of the, uh, the topic of the day I think is going to be seminar training. Because I got a seminar coming up in Florida and, you know, I want to talk about seminar training because I'm someone that has been to quite a few dog training seminars. Some of them were very good and some of them were not so good. But I want to um, talk about the problem with seminar training because seminars are a big thing. A lot of dog trainers, that's how they make their living is they go around and basically do seminars. And there's nothing wrong with that. I say there's nothing wrong with that until you become a seminar trainer in the sense that you're not really trying to get people to a productive place in their training. You're kind of trying to get them to say nice things about your seminar and sign up again. And you'd think that those two things would be one and the same, but they are actually not. By the way, I want you guys to see this campfire I got going here. Is that not a thing of beauty? Now that is a nice campfire. The key is to use a lot of starter fluid. <laughs> Anyways, guys, um, I'm going to wait for more of you to jump on, and then we'll get started. are the internet connection is good i see you guys i see you guys nice to see ya all right guys well i might as well start now no reason to wait any longer you guys can watch it back if you miss some of it so this is going to apply to anything from obedience training competition work protection work uh, behavior modification anything right so there are certain realities that one must accept if one is to talk about seminar or training dogs at seminars. Number one, all right, you can never be certain who's going to show up unless, of course, you've monitored all these people. Like a lot of the time when, when you as a dog trainer having done seminars, right, as both a spectator participant and also as the uh the guy giving the seminar uh the, the trainer at the seminar um you can never be certain who's going to show up and sometimes people are going to come there with a real big curveball they're going to come there with a with a dog that um really shouldn't be there it doesn't belong in that type of setting it doesn't belong in that specific seminar it's not the appropriate dog for that and you have two choices at that point so I'll give you an example as, okay, let's say if I was going to hold a protection seminar, right? Let's say someone brought a really nervous, fearful dog with low drive. And believe me, <laughs> if you go to any kind of uh, big protection seminar, you will see this. Like dogs that are just not at all suited to the work, right? Now, as a trainer, I have two choices. Choice number one, I can make the dog look good as much as it's possible to make such a dog look good. Um, in some cases, it's downright impossible, to be honest with you. But I can do some things to try and just make the handler feel better about the dog and make the dog look as good as it possibly can make it look and not really say anything. Other than, oh, you know, if you just keep working, keep following my system, buy my online courses, whatever, whatever, right? Whatever it is that that you as a trainer are selling, um, you can just kind of keep them going, right? You keep them as a customer, you keep them happy. Um, at least even if they don't buy anything more from you, they're gonna say nice things about you because you didn't really hurt their ego or make them feel a certain way about their dog. Um, but, you know, that's, that's option number one. And to be honest, most dog trainers, especially ones that do a lot of seminars and rely on them for a living, 
will go that route. Where option number two is to say, look, you know, while you're here, I'm going to help you. Obviously, you've paid for me to help you. I'm going to do whatever I can do for this dog um, within, you know, what is reasonable and what is humane. But at the same time, this dog does not belong here, right? This dog does not belong here. He is not suited to this work. If you're serious about pursuing this, you should not have this dog for this work. Get another dog for this work. Keep this dog at home as a pet. That's kind of more what he wants to do. Or maybe he wants to do something a little bit easier for him, like scent detection, so on and so forth. Square peg, round hole. You know, I think if you, if you are realistic with people like that, the downside is some people take that to heart. They get upset. And then they kind of do this thing where they pick trainers, right? I had one lady come to me not too long ago. Um, and she actually brought her dog for a board and train all the way from California. Nice lady. Dog was nervous. Dog was soft. Dog was low drive. She wanted us to do, well, she was struggling with reactivity with the dog. The dog was very reactive because it's fearful, nervous, and insecure. And um, the dog was also, uh, you know, she also wanted to do like some, competition obedience type work with the dog. It was a German Shepherd, right? A little female German Shepherd. So we said, no problem. Well, our priority, of course, is the reactivity. We're going to get rid of that. And then, you know, if there's any time left over, we're going to work on the competition work. Anyways, we get the dog in. And honestly, the dog was much worse than what I was expecting. Not in terms of the reactivity. She wasn't so bad with the reactivity. It's just the level of nervousness, the level of insecurity, and the, 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 the lack of drive in the dock was, was quite pronounced. And, you know, we did the best that we could. You know, the trainer that was working with the dog got the dog out as much as he could, you know, built the dog up as much as he could. The reactivity was gone, which was great. Um, that was the primary focus for us anyways. And, uh, you know, he did what he could in terms of, like, building the ball drive and, 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 and kind of uh, working on some of the more sporty obedience with the dog. But, of course, the priority was just getting the reactivity gone and creating a functional pet. Anyways, the lady comes to pick up her dog, and I talk to her. You know, hey, what do you think of my dog, blah, blah, blah. Hey, well, you know, look, if you want to do, and I think she wanted to do IGP. I said, look, if you want to do IGP, there's better dogs for this. Like, your dog isn't really suited to that. I think you're going to be kind of banging your head against a wall if you do that. I don't think your dog really going to enjoy it. I don't think you're going to, oh, she was all surprised. Well, so-and-so famous trainer said that she was really good. And another trainer said, I'm like looking at, I'm like, bro, these trainers are flat out lying to this lady. If they told her that this dog is any good for this type of work, this dog does not want to do this type of work. And these are famous trainers that we all probably know their names. I'm not going to, of course, say their names, but I think you know, they did this lady a real disservice to tell her something like that because it created an unrealistic expectation. And I could tell she was a little bit upset, right? Because I told her something, maybe not so much that she wanted to hear about her dog. I told her her dog, you know, doesn't have all this potential, that her dog doesn't really want to do all this work, that her dog, you know, is fine as a pet. And, you know, now that the reactivity is gone, the dog is, has no problem functioning in the real world. But a competition dog, this, not, this dog will not be. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, I could see it just really bothered her. And, and then later on, you know, she sent us an email. Oh, you know, the, the reactivity has gone, but, you know, I really feel like you guys didn't do this or that. And in reality, we did all these things. We did all the sporty work with the dog that we could do this and that. And she was just fundamentally upset because, you know, we didn't give her the glowing kind of review of her dog that she expected to receive. And sometimes if you're saying, look, I want an IGP dog and we're looking at the dog through that lens, we're going to have a realistic, we're going to be realistic with you about what that dog can and cannot do. I refuse to lie to people. So I don't know whether she met these trainers at a seminar. I think she did one of them, right? And they just worked the dog a little bit and did a little bit with the dog and then put the dog up or whatever it is. And then told her this stuff. It's like, look, we had the dog for weeks and weeks. And I'm telling you, and I would have seen it right away, uh, and we did see it right away. This is not a dog for that use, right? So seminar training, fundamentally what it is, is it's training that doesn't really have a realistic end state, but it's something that you can do. It's basically lipstick on a pig, right? You can do something in the moment, and if you're a good trainer, you can do this. 
to make a dog look a certain way or to make the handler think a certain outcome is possible, that isn't really very likely to be possible. It isn't very realistic for the handler to do and the outcome isn't going to be the way that you're portraying it. However, when the handler goes off on their own or they go back to their normal trainer and they try to do these things and it doesn't work, of course, you get to say, well, you didn't take my super secret special training, which is why it didn't work for you. My goal with a seminar, right, when I do a seminar, whether I'm doing it as a participant, whether I'm doing it as, uh, as, as the person giving the seminar, is to give people actionable information and training methodologies that they can realistically implement with their dog in their situation, right? And realistic outlooks on the possible outcome with the dog. And I feel like a lot of trainers, look, I get it. Your business is seminars. You want to be invited back. You want to, you know, be doing that same seminar every year, so on and so forth. So you kind of, let's say, butter your bread. Um, but be very careful about that, guys. That's not realistic. We call it in, in the IGP community, like me and my buddies, you know, We'll see some training. We'll be like, oh yeah, that's seminar training, right? So from like a protection, from an IGP standpoint, you know, you'll you'll see like three lines on the dog. There's an e-collar. There's a whip. There's this, that, and everything else. And it's like, you know, of course the dog looks like a absolute monster with all this restraint, all this frustration, all these eights. And of course, you know that when the eights go away, the dog is not going to look even close to what he looks like in that picture, right? But of course, people in the seminar are like, wow, it's amazing. Look at this dog doing all this crazy shit that she or he could never do, right? This is seminar training. You see it on the pet side too, right? Whether it's something as simple as loose leash walking. Oh, let me teach your dog to loose leash walk on a flat collar with food, right? So they'll, they'll do something like they'll pull on the leash and every time they pull on the leash, they'll give the dog food. And if the dog's sufficiently food motivated, the dog's going to stop pulling on the leash and just kind of be always hunting for the food with you. And look, now the dog's not pulling on the leash. All you have to do is do this. And of course, you go in the real world. There's competing motivators. You know, um, there's all these things happening that maybe the dog's not hungry. And of course, that type of loose leash walking doesn't actually work. And you're frustrated, man, why can't I do it? Maybe it's because I'm not like this famous trainer, you know, and, and that's why. And, and maybe if I sign up for more shit with this person or, or I just go to another one of his seminars, I'll figure it out. You know, instead of saying, <laughs> giving you an actionable plan that's actually going to work for you out in the real world. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that every time you try to implement some training or methodology you learned at a seminar, it doesn't work. It's, it's not your fault. For sure, in many cases it is. But I'm always saying I don't like seminar training. I don't like it. It's, it's a lot of it is smoke and mirrors, right? Especially depending on who you go to. A lot of it is designed for the upsell, 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 upsell. More seminars, more glowing reviews, buy this, buy that. Listen guys, I got a lot of things to sell. You notice that in my lives, in my, I almost always forget to mention those things. Speaking of which, I have online courses. Check them out, shieldk9online.com. I have a book, No Nonsense Dog Training. Check that out. I'm working on a second book right now by, um, that I think I'm going to call The Book of Bite Work. And it's going to be a book on A to Z protection training. Um, anyways, where, where was I? Um, yeah, so seminar training. I'm sure some of you have been to seminars. Just understand, if you ever come to my seminar right? I'm not going to seminar train you. You know, there was a, a seminar I did recently, a competition obedience seminar. I did it in the summertime. I think it was July I did it. Might have been last July. <laughs> Time flies. It might have been last July. And you know, it was a competition obedience seminar. Listen, if you're serious about competition obedience, you need a certain kind of dog. All right? Just to be real, you need a dog that has drive. You need a dog that has you know, the basic nervous system that they can handle being in a new place without completely shutting down. Uh, you know, you need a dog that wants something. He must want a food. He must want the toy. He must want something. If he doesn't want anything, what are we going to do, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, some people showed up to the seminar. They had a lot of, like, they had dogs with lots, like a lot of drive, a lot of willingness, um, some foundation even. And then some people show up to the, the seminar, the dog doesn't even want to play with the ball, doesn't want to take any food, is always becoming nervous of, of everything, right? 
It's like, okay, well, what am I really going to do with that dog in two days? What am I going to do? Right? Like, it's realistic, right? It's like, you know, this dog needs an extensive amount of work to even get to the point where we can even start this type of work, right? So, I'm not saying don't go to seminars. I love seminars. But go to them with that outlook. Is this seminar training? Are you just trying to BS me? Or is this real training? And I think too many trainers fall into that habit of making something appear a certain way and maybe not being all the way honest with people about the realistic application of that thing for you in your personal situation. With your specific dog. All right, guys, I'm going to go through your questions. Um, and then uh, let me just add some more wood to this fire. Son of a bitch, the fire collapsed. Well, got. Whoops. Well, guys, I collapsed my pretty campfire, so I don't know how long that's going to be going, but oh well. Um, sorry, where was I? Okay, somebody's asking about the Ocala seminar. How many dogs... Uh, I think right now we have 30 people in that seminar. There's going to be myself and Steven at that seminar, so it's not just me doing the training, um, though I will be doing all the lectures. And um, we will have, I think, 12 dogs for me and then uh, another four or five for Steven. Um, okay, Vicpedia. I got that exact situation last month in a week-long protection seminar. My dog showed a lot of insecurities. As a dog owner, I wasn't aware well, I hope the, the trainer was honest with you. Um, Hemi Orange said, I quit smoking right at COVID lockdown, so I don't miss cigarettes, but I do crave a nice cigar. You know the funny thing for me about cigars? I am not addicted to them. I could stop anytime I want. I could stop anytime I want. I do. Like, when it gets winter... To be honest, I don't smoke cigars very much. <laughs> Sometimes not for months on end. Um, and it's probably because I'm just not that frequent. But, you know, there was a time many years ago where I did smoke cigarettes for a couple of years, especially when I was in college. And um, for whatever reason, that a person that affliction never really stuck with me. So thank thankfully for me, right? Um, the trainer did say protection would help with confidence, but that IGP wasn't a realistic option. You know, I've run into this idea a lot of times with the reactive nervous dogs that, you know, if you just do some protection with them, it's going to make them more confident. I don't buy into that. I have never seen that to be the case. If anything, it creates confusion because usually with the nervous, insecure dogs, they're saying, hey, calm down, relax. There is no threat. There is no reason to, to, to worry. But if you're training those dogs properly, their primary drive is, is reactive aggression. So you're opening that reactive aggression. You're opening that door. And if I see that there's a dog that doesn't have a strong nervous system, I just say don't do protection training whatsoever. Neutralize the dog, build a good play relationship, teach strong obedience, and let that dog live um, you know, the life that it's possible for that dog to live. I don't think protection is a good option to make dogs feel uh, better. I have two bullies. I've seen your video of Chris oh, a year or two ago, and it really motivated me. I'm really taking your course week two. Would you rather teach heel to one on each side or both on the left? One on each side for sure. With two dogs, I always do one on each side. Because when I correct one dog, I don't like the dog to think or associate that correction with the other dog. So if they're touching each other and they're side to side and you're making corrections, there's a small possibility they may say, hey, it's you that is correcting me or just the, the stress, arousal, excitement, whatever it is that you've got going on can cause the dogs to kind of get a little sour on each other. So I, I always teach them one on each side. It's just easier. And it also helps me in my mind figure out who's who, right? Um, who's who on the e-collar, who's who, you know, in terms of their behavior. Oh, that one's lagging a little bit. That one's in the good position. So definitely one on each side. Hey, has you ever come to Western Canada to train? 
Um, no. I think there was somebody that was talking about bringing me out for a seminar. Um, but we haven't confirmed anything, so I'm not going to say anything about that. Lewis says, yes, be realistic. Most seminars I've been to, everyone is told they have a great dog with so much potential. Yeah. Realistically, in every seminar, you know, there's like maybe two, three dogs where it's like something can be done. And the, the rest of them are just kind of like, well, enjoy the ride. Uh, you're not really going to get very far with this one, but. And there's nothing wrong with that. As long as the trainer is realistic with you and gives you a realistic outlook and doesn't blow smoke. Is it okay to ask you a question about my golden doodle puppy? You could ask. Just read the book. It was fantastic. Thanks for all the free content on YouTube. Going to join the online training classes once we get our new puppy in a few weeks. Awesome. Glad you liked it. Do you see many, any working line ger German shepherds that are black and tan? Just curious as most working lines seem to be black, sable, or bicolor. Um, if you mean like traditionally, like a, a show line, no. Um, but my dog Onyx, my last dog, the father of Gage, was a black and tan dog. I have an eight-month-old herder from Essex, England, doing IGP training, learned from somebody who competes in nationals. One before, do you have a course for sport puppies? Um, we have a course uh, for sport dogs, yes. Um, we have a competition obedience courses on, on all the various commands that your dog needs to know for IGP. So, yes, we do have one. Tarek says, hey, has no beer? No, sir. I'm a Muslim. I don't drink. So... Coconut water for me. All right. Having three dogs trained at Shield Canine now, the most valuable thing I learned is how to train the dog. I have not the dog I want. Excellent, Sarah. I'm glad you picked that up. And I'm glad you keep coming back for more. As in a course for raising a puppy all the way to adulthood, a puppy that's doing sports, specifically IGP. Oh, okay. Um, I don't have, like, a specific puppy raising course. Like, oh, I have a course for puppies. Um, and like how I raise them, how I teach them functional obedience, so on and so forth. I wouldn't say that that's a sport specific course. That's just a course that I generally run all my puppies through. Um, but yeah, James Osgood. I came up from London, Ontario last year. Has I did your e-collar seminar? Help low over three activity instead of e-collar. On site gave honest feedback. She's now on to e-collar and working out great james you bring up an excellent point that e-collar seminar is probably the last e-collar seminar i'll ever do and the reason why most of the people that showed up their dog was not ready to be on an e-collar problem with tool-based seminars is tools are simply just an item in your toolbox as a trainer. Um, as much as I know about the e-collar and as much as I wanted to share about the e-collar, most of the people at the seminar were not ready for it. Their dog wasn't ready for it. It wouldn't be productive to put those dogs on e-collars, you know, or to do anything more than the most basic work with the e-collars. So what we ended up with at that seminar was some dogs that, okay, we, we don't even have like a problem that I would choose to fix with an e-collar here. I, I would fix this problem completely as with your dog you know, with a leash and maybe with some other tools um, before I ever even thought about e-collar training. And then, you know, for sure, there were some dogs that could do much more advanced e-collar work. And the e-collar, you know, um, was the right tool for that dog and that trainer at the specific place that they were at. So for now, I don't think I'll do another e-collar seminar unless someone specifically asks and invites me out for one and they have a group of dogs and, and individuals that are ready for that type of training. Can I have your thoughts on using drag work for dog reactivity? If you're referring to this concept that you tire the dog out by making it drag heavy objects to make them less reactive, that's not fixing the problem. It's, it's the most stupid solution I've ever heard of. And it's just one of the many kind of 
seminar training, right? That's exactly what it is, right? Let's just exhaust your dog to the point where they're so exhausted they can't do what they would normally do under realistic circumstances. And somehow that's going to change the, do the dog's default, you know, reaction to the, the stimulation of the presence of another dog. No, it's not. It's just going to cover up the problem in that specific moment with that specific dog, but you're not really addressing the problem, which is you must not be reactive to other dogs. Don't do it. It's not allowed. It's just that simple, right? So another example of overcomplicating something that should really be simple. AJ says, you will be coming to the prairies for a seminar. For sure, once I get everything sorted. Cool, AJ, we'll talk. Um, love to see the videos of green working docs you bring in. So fun. I love to see the transformation while you have them. I love the process, my friend. I love it. Hey, has elite member here. I have a five-month-old German Shepherd. I just got the off-leash course. I was curious. In a couple of years, I want to do sport. What's the best way to study what I want in a sport dog? Um, if you're referring to the current dog you have, like if you can do sport with that dog... It would depend on that dog's quality and like what, you know, behavioral traits and, and genetic traits he brings to the table. Um, but it's possible you could definitely do it with him. I functionally train all my sport dogs. Like Gage just fully functionally trained. Yaxi, even though he's no longer going to be my sport dog, was is also fully functionally obedience trained. And functional obedience, for those of you that don't know, is the off-leash obedience that we treat, teach all the dogs that come through our program on the street. It's like, this is how you walk down the street. This is how you behave in public. Functional obedience for the real world. It's the same obedience that I put on all our um, competition, or sorry, all our like uh, real protection dogs, you know, even police service dogs. It's the same exact stuff because it's functional obedience for the street. And then there's, of course, competition obedience for the competition field, which is a very different thing. KMPV looks more fun than IGP to me. Different, uh, different strokes for different folks, Doug. Give it a shot. Do you still have your Dutch Shepherd? No, I do not. I'm in the business of training and selling dogs. And that dog I sold a while ago. If the dog has to drive for protection work, but as an owner, I'm only good enough for functional obedience, should I rehome this dog? Or is there a path exercise routine to contain this dog's drive? No, of course. Like, look, if you don't want to do protection with a, with a dog that, you know, has the ability to do protection, you certainly don't have to. There are other things that you can do with that dog, really intense forms of play, things like this. You don't definitely don't have to rehome a dog just because it has the drive and, and the courage to do protection work but you don't have the time or inclination to do it it's definitely not a reason to rehome a dog in florida so i wish i was closer love when you sit and chat with us thanks for doing these well chris tell i'm coming to florida in less than two weeks i believe labor day weekend you can sign up for an uh, audit spot if you don't want to bring your dog. Uh, is there a package for that kind of sport puppy training? That's from Jack. Yes, there is. Um, there's a, a, a power obedience package, which is all the competition obedience courses wrapped up uh, into one package. So that would be the one I would take if I had a sport dog. Who's your top three or five dogs online? Gage is one of mine. Also, Roz Al Ghul that I mentioned the other night. This is from Jack. Um, also, would you try KMPV instead? No, I have no interest in KMPV. I mean, it's a cool sport, and I appreciate it for what it is, but uh, it's just not for me on the level of IGP. IGP, the level of complexity is just so maddening, <laughs> and I love being challenged, so uh igp it is for me if i lived in the netherlands maybe i'd do cam pv but i don't
Shayna says, I bought the off leash course and the reactive rehab and the secret sauce. I left them all. Would love to see more of Kevin, the Ov Charka. You guys will see more of Kevin soon. Larry Crone, big bad Larry, comments, he's not bad. <laughs> well, I guess he could be. Um, honesty hurts. You're right, Larry. It sure does. I've got to figure out how to make my honesty hurt a little less sometimes. Damn it. My cigarette's out. Cigarette. My cigar. Sorry, guys. I just committed a blasphemy. Because someone was talking about cigar uh, cigarettes earlier. Let me let's relight it. You know what? Along with what Larry just said, um, I just want to comment on that. There's a line between telling the truth, but also not needlessly hurting people's feelings. And sometimes I failed at that. Sometimes in my, you know, just kind of like old, my my concern, I'm I'm a. I'm not a particularly, like, emotional person. So, like, you know, my concern with, even though I really love to work with the emotions of the dogs, especially, like, in competition obedience and stuff like that, I'm very in tune with the emotions of the dogs because that's where you get the best performance. But in terms of my, like, people skills, one of my areas that I do need more work is in being a bit more of a people person, you know. Sometimes... Oh, that's an interesting bird noise. Anyway, sometimes I've I've definitely kind of uh, I'm a little bit too abrasive, um, and it's not intentional. It's just because I'm kind of like it's not like I'm thinking oh like I want to be abrasive to this individual. It's more like you know I just kind of want to get to the point. I want to get directly to the root, you know. But it can definitely be off-putting, and you know, for some people it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Um, and for me, it's all about what you say, not so much how you say it. Um, but that's not how everybody thinks. So, you know, one area that I could definitely work on is maybe being a little bit more of a people person, being a little bit more aware of, you know, the packaging that I wrap my message in. Um, and perhaps if I were to improve that, I would reach more people or perhaps I wouldn't. The one thing I've always thought is the package that I wrap my message in is only opened by the people that are ready for what I'm delivering, the message I'm delivering. But maybe I'm wrong. Feel free to tell me if you think I'm wrong. I don't care. Pick my boy up from your board and train next week. Enjoy the content. Well, if you're picking your dog up from my board and train, I'm going to tell you this. The only thing that really ever bothers me with board and train clients, no matter how many times we tell people this, some people still don't get it. We did the hard work so you don't have to. And that's what you paid for with the board and train. But you still have to do some work. You have to do the back end work. You have to do the maintenance work. If you don't do that maintenance work, if you don't keep the dog in that structure, in that lifestyle that he is now used to, the dog will fall off. The dog will revert back to some of those behaviors. And I don't know which dog you have, but the dog will definitely revert back to some of those unwanted behaviors that he or she was performing before the board and train. And there are some people that they think they have like a computer or something. Well, we sent you the computer for programming and it still doesn't work. It's like, no, stupid. You just haven't done any. See, again, this is what we were talking about with how you package your information. No, this is, the better way to say that would be, no, this is, you know, not the appropriate way to look at a dog. A dog, you know, needs that consistency. And if you're not going to give that consistency, it's not going to work out very well for you or for the dog. It's not fair for the dog. And the, the thing that bothers me with some people is they, they, even though they say, yeah, 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 I understand, I understand, they clearly don't understand because they go home and immediately start doing exactly the opposite of what we told them to do. And then they're like concerned and curious as to why, the outcome is not what the outcome was when they saw the dog here, right? I always say, if your dog is doing something here and he's not doing it at home, the problem is you, right? But the problem isn't you like as in it's your fault and you're a bad person. The problem is you in that you're just doing something not the right way. So instead of just trying to go it alone or, you know, just thinking, oh, the programming didn't work or, you know, whatever it is, just call us, come back, do a refresher session. That's why we offer like, 
all these refresher sessions because we want you to be successful. We want your dog to be successful. We want you to be walking around singing our praises. Of course, we're, you know, we're a business. It's, this is, you know, and, and, uh, you know, if you're not successful, we're not successful. So, All right, let's see. Um, a black Russian Terrier pup. Would love to do IGP with her, but have very few clubs in New Zealand. I've purchased your book. Great book. We'll do competition obedience for now and scent work. Awesome. Do what you can do. Sorry, guys. Got a puff on this thing hard. Otherwise, it's going to go out. Hey, Has, what brand is the coconut water? These guys should sponsor me the amount of times I use this stuff. Thirsty Buddha. I love this stuff. Everybody in uh, Steven. I got Steven, my my GM, and um, Dan, my video guy. They're all addicted to it now. They're always drinking it in my kennel um, because I have a whole fridge stocked with it at the um, in my office in the kennel. Or sorry, at my training facility. And they love this stuff. It's great. You know, it's like soda, but it's not soda and way less um, calories, way less bad ingredients. Uh, let's see. What do you think is missing or can be changed in the European breeding to be better? What European breeding? Right? Like what? Like they they breed a lot of things in Europe. I mean, like there's programs like the KMPB program and, you know, the Belgian ring program that produce really good dogs consistently. Healthy dogs. And they're certainly a lot less regulated than the IGP program, right? Less regulations, less rules. Uh, the females often are not even worked or titled. And yet they produce, I would say, on average, probably stronger, more functional dogs than, than um, uh, a lot of the dogs being produced in IGP programs. So, you know... I, I, you know, but then there's kennels that produce, you know, that train and, and uh, breed dogs for IGP that, that have a stellar record. So it's like, what kennel, what dog? You have to be much more specific with a question like that. Any plans on doing an online course for training multiple dogs in a home? I don't need to. You can just take my existing online course and apply it to all the dogs in your home. Um, it doesn't change with, with multiple dogs. Uh, do you have some favorite trainers in the U.S.? Larry says, most trainers provide entertainment at seminars, not actual education for the long term. That's Larry Crone, for those of you wondering. You're right, Larry. You're very much right. Um, and uh, I know you do a lot of seminars. So you, I will assume, know what you're doing. I haven't uh, been to one of your seminars, so I can't give a firsthand review. But uh, judging by how many people... Uh, you know, have been, and to how many seminars you do, I assume you must be very good at what you do. So, um, yeah, and and I've been to certainly the the kind of the entertainers, like they got the whole mic set up, they got the PowerPoint, they got the videos, they got everything, and it's it's really cool, but a lot of it is hocus pocus, you know. So I don't like that stuff, but some people do. Uh, do I have some favorite trainers in the U.S.? Hmm. By the way, Larry, if you're still on here, aren't you coming to uh, Toronto? You should come my way. I'm like, uh, I'm not far from Toronto. I'm about 45, 50 minutes. We could do a podcast. I'm, I'm getting my podcast studio set up, and I'm going to talk to trainers there. I'd love to have you out for a podcast. So if you're still on here, let's do it, man. Or maybe I could come to you. Depends on where you are in Toronto. Toronto's a big city. I mean, there's a lot of trainers that I like in the U.S. I think the U.S. has some of the best breeders and trainers now in the world. Um, you know, I like Stefan Schaub, von der Staatsmacht. Uh, I've been to him a bunch of times. I like his breeding program. I like his dogs. I like him. Um, you guys know I've been to Diamond. I interviewed him. Diamond's awesome. I mean, you guys are going to ask me. I'm going to give you a bunch of IGP trainers. <laughs> um, you know, those are a couple that just spring to mind. Um for the pet dogs and the behavior stuff, there's Larry. Um, you know, 
I like uh, a lot of what I've seen him do. He's always a trainer that's uh, that's interested in me. And I'm not just saying that because he's on here. Um, the thing I like about Larry, and I, I know that we've got to peel it back a little bit. So if I do get to sit down with him for a seminar, I will. Oh, sorry, for an interview, I will. For sure, we differ on some things or I'm misunderstanding some stuff. And he says some stuff that I find intriguing where I like intrinsically want to say that's bullshit. And then I'm like, well, he says it with a ton of like belief. And I know he's not someone that can't train dogs. He surely can. So I'd love to, 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 to open that can of worms with him a little bit. I know Larry interviewed me, um, on his, uh, on his platform, but when, you know, you're being interviewed, you're, you're kind of there to answer questions. You're not there to, you know, I, I just kind of let, let whoever's interviewing me lead when I'm being interviewed. But, um, I'd like to, I'd like to peel that back with Larry a little bit, you know, maybe we'll get into an argument. Maybe we'll see eye to eye on something. I think there's more to unpack there with Larry. Um, how about a seminar in Indiana? Listen, if you want me to come down for a seminar, hit my team up. Let me know what you have in mind. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. (laughs) Anita says, stay true to yourself and screw them all. That's one outlook, and it's certainly a good outlook. The problem is um, sometimes that can lead to, uh, what's the word, hubris, right? So there's a, there's a balance between self-confidence and humorous. Hello, Has. Greetings from Germany. Greetings. You know what other U.S. trainer whose stuff I really liked? Um, just I've only ever seen it on video. I don't think he does anything anymore related to dogs, but I could be wrong. Uh, Don Sullivan. I think he's like a, a hunting dog guy. I really liked his work. Very classic, very like old school work, but super, super functional. And he has a ton of um, ton of proof that what he does works. Another trainer whose stuff I'd be interested in, just because it seems a little bit different, and I've never seen it in person. Yeah, I've seen some of his videos, some of his training stuff. Um, Ivan Balbanov. If he had a seminar out this way, I'd probably go. I'd probably go just to kind of see what he says, see what he does. I'm sure I'd pick up a few uh, few things from a, from a guy that's uh, been around that long and done all the things that he's done. What kind of cigar humidor do you use? Nothing, nothing specifically fancy, I don't think. Love your content. You inspire me to make my own coffee test video. If you have a chance, check it out. That would be awesome. That's from the Distracted Dog. Okay, I will. Drag a dog. Drag work. So this is he's he's uh this is AR97 who's elaborating now on what drag work is. To give the dog an outlet for conflict also help me condition the collar as a communication tool and not a restraint device. Can it help with a dog with dog reactivity with a bit of selective attention? Uh, to be honest, man, I'm not quite sure what you're saying with that, so I can't speak to it. I can't speak. I'm not sure exactly what context you're talking about using the e-collar in there, so I cannot speak to it. Uh, can I skip prong collar and go straight to the e-collar with the Martingale collar for an 11-month-old high drive Sherman Shepherd, the dog I mentioned before, adopting this dog from someone who abandoned it? Luke, you can do anything you want with an e-collar if you know what you're doing. If you don't, then don't do it. That's my short answer to your complicated question. Do you see a bottleneck in the German Shepherd and Malinois breed? I think in the German Shepherd, there's certainly a bottleneck. Um, I think that using approved studs uh, from the Belgian Malinois and maybe even the Dutch Shepherds um, uh, would be a, an excellent idea to outcross, to bring in a little bit more um, uh, he- uh, improvement in the overall health and uh, working quality of the German Shepherd. Um Primarily the health, though, is, 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 I think, something that still needs improvement. Um, and I think it would definitely greatly reduce the bottlenecking that exists. Instead, the SV, um, the governing body for breeding German Shepherds that, uh, that we use, that, um, that we breed to the German standard, is making it more complicated. And they're removing more dogs from the gene pool, including long coats and other such things that they shouldn't be doing. We need an updated video of Dizzy. I'll tell you what happened with Dizzy. One of my kennel staff liked her so much. And this dog was sitting at home because this was a dog that, um, unfortunately, 
you know, she just didn't have the nervous system that I needed to do any kind of meaningful bite work or, or competition work with. Um, so I just wasn't really interested in pursuing it. So I was leaving her at home and she was hanging out with my son, but she was still a Belgian Malinois. She still needed to do things. Um, <laughs> a lot of my kennel staff really liked her. He wanted to do stuff with her. Um, so I actually ended up giving him the dog and, uh, she still comes to work every day, but she lives with him now. And I think she's a lot happier. Larry Anderson, are the grassroots canine seminars good? I actually had Mike out to my spot um, for a seminar years ago, and I think it's quite good. I think Mike really, so Mike's Mike's really done a good thing in that he's really niched himself. Like, it's not that he can't do a lot of things. I know the guy for a fact that he can. Um, it's that he's really, like, with his seminars, like, he's really kind of focused in on, I think, one thing specifically. Um, and sorry, Mike, if I'm, you know, saying something that's wrong here, but my perception of, of, of like what you're doing at your seminars is primarily decoy work, grip development, stuff like that. And I think it's something that he really loves and he's very passionate about and he's also very good at. Um, and, uh, you know, he teaches that and he teaches it very well. And uh, I think that, um, you know, if, if you want to understand the mechanics of decoy work, if you want to understand you know, how to uh, do grip development and stuff like that. And in, in the, the type of training that Mike does, I think, you know, there's, there's uh, he's a very good, he runs a very good seminar and I'd certainly recommend that you go check it out. You know, if I was a young person or a young person, if I was um, somebody that wanted to learn more about decoy work, learn more about dog training in general, I'd definitely hit up um, one of Mike's seminars. <coughs> well, let me see here. What else we got? Some of you guys are trolling me. Any opinions on German... <laughs> any opinions on DDR German Shepherds? All right. Finally ordered the book. Need to get more people turned on to your training. That's from Mitch. Thanks, Mitch. Um, I simply wanted to say thank you for the videos. If not for what you put out for everyone, and straight to the point, no BS wisdom, I wouldn't have... My full blood German Shepherd service dog. Awesome. Would you accept volunteer help at your facility for someone looking to get into dog training and willing to prove themselves? Send us a resume. Send us a resume. How do you feel about VRL Sintis breedings? I don't know the guy. I can't feel anything about those breedings. Um, I know he got himself famous on Facebook for his uh, exciting decoy videos. Um, but uh, other than that, I don't know anything about him. Um, what do you think of American Standard Dog Training? I don't know him. Again, I don't know him. Believe it or not, I don't really watch a ton of other dog trainers on YouTube. Um, you know, look, if somebody like Barb Bellon posts something, if, you know, some... Some guys that obviously are, are legends in the game post something. I'll often watch it, um, you know. But, like, if it's, like, just, like, you know, another standard YouTuber on... on, on I, don't, I don't catch a lot of it, to be honest with you. Any opinions on DDR German Shepherds? This is from Yesenia Vales, who has one of our dogs. Um, and Yesenia, sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Um, my opinion on DDR dogs, check dogs, all these dogs. The days of separating dogs by locality is over, okay? It's over. Look, I'm in the market right now for two very high-level competition dogs, okay? I want really strong, powerful dogs. Uh, both me and Carson are looking to buy a couple of dogs for um, IGP competition, and we're looking to spend, uh, you know, we're looking to buy top-tier, world-class dogs. You know one thing I've never sent to anybody, um, any of the vendors that I've contacted, any of the people in Europe or, or anywhere else that I've contacted about these dogs, you know one thing I've never said to them? I've never said, I'm looking for a Czech dog. I'm looking for a DDR dog. I'm looking for this. And I don't do that because it's not important. It's the least important thing. And, and people are not really, very few people, especially people that are serious about the working quality of the dogs, they're not separating their breeding by locality. They're simply saying, What's the best dog? What's the best health? What's the best pedigree? Let's put these dogs together and, and, and make good dogs.
I always say to people when they ask these questions, I'm like, listen, no pros, no people that are serious about working dogs that actually train and work these dogs, that buy and sell these dogs, that, that, that breed these dogs in any kind of meaningful way ever talk about that. They don't care. Now, there are certainly dogs that come from the Czech Republic. I buy dogs from the Czech Republic all the time. But when you look in the pedigree, very few of them are, are pure past like two or three generations. There's West German in there. There's dogs from other parts of Europe in there. But I don't care. It doesn't matter. It doesn't impact the dogs. Like this mythical DDR and Czech. Like this is something that's only interesting for people. It's a, sell, it's a sales gimmick that people use. You know, look, if you want a big, dark sable dog that can do protection work, that, that, is, that is a brave, imposing dog, I got two in my kennel right now. They're not DDR, <laughs> you know. You can get that dog without saying, oh, this is a DDR dog, right? And, and I don't even think anybody's really breeding the DDR dogs. And I guarantee you this. I promise you this. If someone is exclusively breeding dogs from just Czech locality or DDR, I almost guarantee that they have sacrificed the quality and health of the dogs in order to maintain that purity. I guarantee it. Show me their dogs. Show me the dogs that they're using. Not one. Show me a few of the dogs that they're using. I guarantee it. There was one dog that they were promoting recently. Oh, this is like the next best thing from, you know, the Czech Republic, blah, 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 and the whole thing. He's pure Czech lineage, police and protection dogs only. I looked at the work of this dog. This dog was like not even, his work was not even of the standard that I would sell him as a protection dog. So give me a break with that stuff. Do I think German Shepherds are becoming an off-breed in the sport world? No, certainly not, especially not an IGP. Don't get it twisted. A lot of the time when the German Shepherds and the Malinois go head-to-head -head in the game of IGP, the German Shepherds come out on top. Check out the FCI Worlds if you don't believe me. How's your Vom Eisenkraut's pup doing? She's doing quite well. Uh, Max says, hey, brother, about your book. Not long ago, just finished it up. It was amazing. Thanks for all the information. Awesome, buddy. Glad you liked it. Hey, has greetings from Venezuela. What do you think about Michael Ellis? I think Michael Ellis is an excellent gateway into dog training for people that don't really understand dog training. He was certainly impactful in my entry into dog training. I learned a lot um, by reading his content and watching his content. Um... You know, I think uh, I think he's a great way for you to begin to understand how to utilize operant conditioning, luring, all these types of things to further enhance your ability to communicate with other dogs. Uh, do I watch any Justin Rigdon? Don't know who that is. What do I think of Gemini Canine from Scarborough? You mean Chris Rolex? I like Chris. Chris is awesome. His wife's Margarita is awesome. Um, I see them at the Expos all the time. By the way, Shield Canine will be at the upcoming... Uh, CRBE Expo, um, September 16th and 17th, I believe is the dates. Uh, we will be there. And I'm sure Chris will be there because he's at every single one of them. Opinions on Dobermans. Uh, good looking dogs if they're cropped and docked and, and, and have a nice structure. Uh, can be a little bit high strung. Definitely don't live up to the hype that they have. Uh, a few of them can make good protection dogs. Most of them do not. Ri uh, riddled with health issues. They're another dog that really needs to be outcrossed um, selectively and uh, probably never will be. And, and because the banning on cropping and docking um, that's spreading across North America and Europe uh, will soon probably not be a breed that we see in the next 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I was told by a trainer that the money in protection dog training isn't good. Is that true? Very true. You make next to no money. I don't do a lot of protection dog training in terms of like outside dogs. I'm not one of these people that does a ton of bite work with outside dogs. Um, there just isn't much money in it. And uh, it's not worth the abuse and the beating that my body takes doing it. Um, and it's not particularly enjoyable for me to do it with dogs that are less than stellar at it anyways. Um, even selling protection dogs, you know, people see the big numbers these dogs go for and they're like wow you must make so much money you know you know how many years i sold protection dogs for less than it was worth to even keep them in the kennel just because i liked the training and i liked developing the dogs and i liked 
you know, having these types of dogs in the kennel and doing work with them every day. But I didn't really make money, right? Now I make some money selling them, but that's because, you know, I've built my brand, I've built my I've built myself up to the stage where I can sell them for good money. But realistically, look, if I stopped selling protection dogs tomorrow, I'd I probably actually even make more money because that's gonna free up spaces in my kennel for pet dogs. And if you look at it from a monthly perspective, you make a lot more on pet dogs than protection dogs. I was told by a trainer, oh, sorry, I read that one already. Do you think uh, something that makes, not the word, the, sorry, guys, like that's, like, I'm, tr I'm having trouble reading your sentence here. Uh, do you think something that makes not that welcome the German Shepherd on the BRN programs, and what about these Bull X Shepherd mixes that some people are doing? People are always doing all sorts of mixes. Um, you know, most of them turn out to be, you know, nothing better than what we already have in the purebred dogs. Um, some of them look interesting. Um, the reality is, you know, in some KNPV breedings, there is bull breeds there, regardless of what the pedigree says. You can see it in the structure of the dogs. Um, you know, you hear that there's certainly pit bull in, in some of the uh, well-known uh, KNPV bred dogs. Um, why is German Shepherds not welcome? I mean, I don't think that it's not that they're welcome. I mean, I just don't think that they really need to use them very much because they're getting all the things that they need without using that breed so much. But I do think there are German Shepherds in the, in the BRN program. What are your expectations for a dog doing a two to three board and train with, I assume you mean two to three weeks. Does it vary by breed? It varies by breed, it varies by issue. I don't do any behavioral issues on a two week board and train. Two week board and train, I'm just looking for uh, decent functional obedience on the leash, get rid of the pulling, any very minor behavioral problems. Um, you know, have a dog that'll sit down, place, um, you know, and walk nicely for the handler. It's a two week board and train. Um, Three weeks, we want to get an off-leash recall in there. We want to get some off-leash stays going. Uh, basic e-collar training, again, no serious behavioral issues in a short program like that. Uh, it's funny, always people are like, oh, I want, I got this dog that's really aggressive. Uh, we'd like to send him for your two-week program. No, no, that's not going to happen. Three-week program, no. <laughs> you don't cure serious behavioral issues in two to three weeks, at least not if you're being honest with people. We have a six-month-old Kenna Corso puppy, and with your book, his training is coming along great. But his confidence is all over. Sometimes he's confident. Sometimes he's scared of his own shadow. Any advice? He's six months old. Let him grow and develop. Louis Sosa says, are you talking about Zub? <laughs> ah, Louis! Smart man. I didn't say the name. You did. Have you watched Bully Vom Drakenwolf owned by Dominic Scarberry? I have not seen the dog. I'm sure I will at some point. Are your green dogs still green? They're greenish. I really like the size of Gage. How much does he weigh? My bully is 130 pounds. Nothing but health issues. Gage is a little bit too small. I like bigger German Shepherds. Um, you know, do I like the size? I wish he had a little more size, you know. Some people look at the size and say, well, he's less likely to get injured, and I'll agree with that, but he does get injured. Pros and cons um, to getting a green dog versus getting a puppy. I saw you had green dogs available, and I've been debating which route to go. Well, the pros of a green dog are you kind of know what you're getting. You know what the dog's behavior is. You know what the dog's temperament is. You know what the dog's drive traits are. You know how big the dog's going to be, pretty much. Um, there's a lot more that is known with a green dog. Um, the cons, they're significantly more expensive than a puppy. Um, the pros of a puppy, uh, less investment up front, um, more of a blank slate that you get to kind of develop from day one, so to speak. Um, 
So it really depends. And you can pick, of course, the breeding that you want. How is that black puppy you purchased? You're talking about um, Bang, Bang Bomb Eisenkrauts. She's good. She's a challenging puppy to train, um, but I'm training her. Your top five commands to teach a German Shepherd puppy outside of the crate and potty training. Come, sit, down, heel, stay, place. What's your favorite view on Ken Corsos for home and personal protection? What's my view on Ken Corsos for home and uh, personal protection? Most of them are nervy dogs um, that I wouldn't even trust to do that. But uh, for sure there are some that are good dogs that you can you know, use for that purpose. Aren't medium-sized German Shepherds better for sport because they have more agility, endurance, and speed? I would argue that some of the most well-known German Shepherds in dog sport over the last 10 years have been very large. <laughs> Lewis goes, <laughs> Lewis, you're, you are a shit disturber, my friend. I'm probably going to get some flack over this, but hey, you said it. And look, the dog is being offered for studs, so whatever, let's talk about Zoo. What in the hell? Has anybody looked at that dog's work and said, God damn, we need more of that. Like, he's big, he's pretty, but, like, the work is terrible. Front, he's biting with his canines. You can see he's in avoidance on the grip. Like, this is not the behavior of a stud dog. Like, what in God's name is going on? You know, like, I, I don't understand why anybody would think that that's a good dog to breed to. And that's why you don't hear anything about the puppies, you know, like in, in terms of real work. Not, oh, they're great. This is another thing you see all the time, you know. People always say, oh, this dog's great. That dog, like I have a dog out of this famous stud dog. He's great. Or I have a dog from this famous breeder. He's great. And then you see their dog and it's like from the objective perspective of evaluating that dog from a work, you know, not their intrinsic value as a living being. The dog is not great. The dog is garbage, right? It's 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 really poor quality dog, but seeing how the dog is bred, there's no you know there's no surprise there. Let's see, guys. I'm going through some of this stuff. Did I get to watch Yarrow and Danny at nationals? Oh. Um, Danny's a nice girl. I met her there briefly. Um, let me see. I know they got a good tracking score. I wasn't there on their tracking day. Um, I'm going to be straight up. I think I missed all three of their phases. Oh, no. I saw their uh, obedience. I saw their obedience. Part of their obedience. That's all I saw from them. Um, but she seemed like a nice girl. Um, the dog, uh, the dog seemed very stable. Pretty, pretty dog. Did well in the dog show. Um, and I think she got third. Um, unfortunately, she got a 78 in the obedience. So she did not make the world team this year. Um, some people were pretty upset about that because they said, you know, the judge just could have given her a little two extra points and she would have been on the world team. Canada's world team this year was is only three dogs, right? I would have been on the world team if I had... Uh, past regionals but because we didn't pass regionals even though we got the score at nationals um to be number four on the canadian world team we just weren't of course able to go the winner of nationals and lee uh also didn't get um uh can't go to the canadian worlds because or sorry the the world team because he didn't compete at our regional event either so i think there should be an exception for the the like the the um, the Canadian national champion, like I don't care if you participated in regionals or failed regionals. If you're the Canadian national champion, you should be on the Canadian world team. It's crazy to me that we're not, because I think Anne's dog, um, with a little bit of tweaking, will do very well on the world level. So yeah, our world team this year, instead of five dogs, we're only sending three. Would I ever get into judging? No, I don't have the time for that. Maybe when I'm old. Any advice on someone looking into to get their first Malinois? Yeah, do your homework. Most of the Malinois available in North America are not very good, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Vida de C. Sal says, Eclipse is the name of the presso who you trained. Um, you're talking about James Dog. And a lot of people saying that's a traditional presso. And Lima Curto says, that's just a weird mixed dog. Uh, Eclipse was a very stable presso. Um, you know, he could do uh, some protection work, um, as is appropriate for the breed. But he was also very stable. Uh, he was a very good-looking dog. Um, I think stability is something that a lot of presses are, are missing, and I think Eclipse brings a ton of stability as well as the looks and, and, and of course, the, the pigmentation that a lot of people want in the Pressa. You know, I don't, I don't think that uh, it's a bad idea to use him in breeding with the right females, and I know James has him in Portugal and is using him a lot. Can you talk more about the dog that won Canadian Nationals? Well, I don't know that much about the dog. I mean, I've caught some of the work. Um, you know, Ann Lee's dog, I think it's out. It's from his... Ann Lee and myself are the only two people at Nationals, I believe, showing a dog from our personal breeding. You know, I had Gage, who's from my breeding, and he had his dog Bond from his breeding. I liked his dog, um, especially as a competition dog. He was fast in the obedience. And Lee also got 81 points in the obedience, which I think was highway robbery. Um, you know, uh, he, he, he definitely should have gotten a lot more for its obedience. Um, you know, uh, on, in the track, the dog looked uh, correct on the track to me. Um, you know, definitely, you know, the dog was there in the tracking. And then the protection was technical, technically, I think, perfect. And uh, the grips on the dog are very good. So, you know, on the world level, that dog should do very well in competition. I think uh, Ann Lee's a good trainer. He's a great guy, by the way. I met him for the first time at Nationals. Like, we've talked a lot. Um, we've talked a little bit. I shouldn't say a lot. We've talked a little bit via Messenger and stuff. But uh, when I met him in Nationals, I really liked him. Uh, just a really uh, easy guy to like. And, um, you know, I definitely uh, wouldn't mind training with him or hanging out with him anytime. And I think uh, he will do well with that dog. The dog's only two and a half years old. Uh, you want your Malwa to stop tearing up the house? You got to learn, my friend. You just got this dog and you didn't read the user manual. Uh, first, crate train your dog. Um, and uh, you know what? Get my puppy program online. You need it. I'm going to sell it to you. Chandra Dinsmore, the wife of Jack Dinsmore. Big bad Jack. If you guys watch my um, vlog, you saw Jack, one of the guys that... Uh, Help me prepare my dog for nationals. Um, great helper. Uh, always late to the party. <laughs> well, I'm always late to the party too. AR97. You rock, man. Uh, thanks for your patience. You and Larry should definitely get together. I borrow from you both. And Ivan, finding a style to train the dog in front of you makes me borrow from great minds. Every dog trainer out there borrows. Every dog trainer out there borrows. You know... Um, Larry, Ivan, I'm pretty sure I've probably taken stuff from them over the years. Um, you know, everybody borrows. Um, I guarantee you, if I went to a seminar from either of those guys, I'd end up taking something, something that I'd end up using down the road, or I would adapt it to something I use. It's always a good idea, you know, to not assume that you know everything. <coughs> There's always someone out there that's figured it out just a little bit better than you have. Or maybe they'll give you something that, uh, uh, you know, that you maybe didn't know or think about, right? Um, Nico is, um, so this is from Yesenia. Nico has been doing super in training. You'd be proud of him. You know, it's funny that you, you, you know, Yesenia is uh, somebody that bought a protection dog from us. And a lot of people buy protection dogs from us and the dog basically becomes a pet for the rest of its life. You're someone that's really got bit by the bug and you jumped into training and, you know, I really like what you've done with Nico. Like, I sold you Nico as a protection dog, you know, but I don't think there's, like, he has, like, crazy amounts of drive that he could be, like, a really good competition dog. Um, I think he's really good, uh, like, family protection dog, which is what I sold him to you for. Um, but it's interesting to see that you've been bitten by the bug of dog training, you know. When you're ready for your next dog, um, whether that's at the end of uh, Nico's life or, you know, so on and so forth, however you choose to structure it, um, I'll definitely give you something with a little bit more pep the next time. 
um, that you can do your recreational bide work and your competition work as well as having a family protector. It's always interesting to see because some people say they want this, that, and everything else, and then they end up never doing anything with the dog. And then some people say they just want a family protection dog, and then they end up getting bitten by the bug, and they're out there doing all this bite work with the dog. So it's hilarious. Have you thought about doing an audiobook for your book? Yeah, I've thought about it. It's, it's one of the many things that I need to get on. Um, I had a guy, but he flaked on me. So now I got to find another guy. You know, I got to find somebody that's got like kind of the voice that I want my book to be spoken in. Apex Canine. Are you like the Apex Canine? There's a bunch of Apex Canine, so I'm not sure which one you are. Um, I have borrowed from the Shield Canine Method many times. When you're right, you're right. Thanks, my friend. Just as I borrow from others, I don't borrow, I use, right, from others, and I adapt. Um, I'm glad that others, uh, you know, borrow, use, and adapt from me. That's that's the, the cycle, right, that we want to be involved in. You want to give value as well as receive value. Hey, I bought the Elite Gold Package and your book. Both have been awesome. My shepherd whines a lot when waiting at a threshold or holding a position. How can I stop the whining? So when your dog is whining in frustration or anticipation, um, quite simply, again, I'm not going to give you some seminar training idea. Uh, I, You have to decide, okay, so some dogs are very predisposed to this behavior. If it's very pervasive and it's extremely annoying where the dog's just screaming at the door because he wants to go out, for sure this is something I'll correct. If this is something that I know, if I just make the dog wait, like he'll whine a bit and then he'll be quiet, I'll wait till he's quiet, then I'll let him go, Right. Um, but if it's like just ridiculous in terms of like, he's just making so much noise ah, 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 for sure. No. And a correction. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll suppress him a little bit there and not allow him to get into that mindset. Use your own voice. The passion of the actual author needs to come through. The problem with that is I would need to actually record it. And, uh, that's more, more work than I want to take on right now. When will the trainer's course come out after the restructure? which we're currently in the middle of, of our um, online training, the trainer's course will come out. It's not really like, the, the way the trainer's course is going to go is this. You're actually going to need to watch all the content that we've already put out in terms of the puppy course, the elite off-leash course, so on and so forth. Um, what the trainer's course is going to be is it's going to be a direct interaction between you, me, and my other uh, trainers that I've selected to oversee the process. And it's going to be a testing process where you prove what it is it, where you prove that you can achieve the standards that we've established um, that you need to be able to achieve in order to be certified. Um, it's going to be, uh, there's going to be a written test that's not going to be a joke of a test, multiple choice bullshit. It's going to be a serious test where we're going to provide you with actual problems that you need to solve. And then there's actually going to be um, a video test where you're going to have to show an unedited version that we will post on our YouTube channel for everyone to see of your work so people can see that you either can or cannot train a dog. <laughs> troll, Miss Clark, in what scenario would you use positive only training? Just a troll question. Um, if in any scenario, the only scenario I could see myself using it in would be scent detection. But even then, I'd probably throw some negative reinforcement in there. Are trainers who train aggressive dogs basically fearless when it comes to being bitten? No, I'm very afraid of being bitten, Maria. I do not like being bitten. I've been bitten a number of times. It is not pleasant. It is definitely not something that I am fearless about. I accept that it probably will happen again. Um, but I do take uh, precautions to avoid it as much as I can. Um... I've owned a press canary for over 10 years. Do you think you I could handle a Dutch Shepherd? If you have a good plan going into it, I'm sure you could. It depends on the kind of Dutch Shepherd you get, you know? Hmm. All right, guys. Any other questions? I'm going to give you guys a minute or two to drop some more questions. This was a great live. I like doing lives next to the campfire in the lake. I should do this more often.
Dog trainer Cebu. Good trainer, elite member. Pleasant evening. Do you think game dogs can be trained for personal protection? Yes, I think they can, but I think their proclivity towards dog aggression makes that a problem. Like, I mean, think about it. If your protection dog has the potential to go and attack or the proclivity to go attack and kill other dogs, even if you suppress it and control it to some degree, is that the best dog out there as a protection dog? I mean, I don't know about you, but most places I go, there's other dogs. And I don't need to be worrying that my dog wants to go and literally kill them. Um, so, yeah, that's not that's why they're not my favorite. The good thing about the game dogs is they're very intense and they're very focused. Um, you know, there, there's not a lot of quit in those dogs, and they, they've been bred like that. Um, the bad thing is, like I said, that dog aggression. And, of course, a lot of them have problems with secondary control because they're literally bred to get after something and not stop no matter what. And that no matter what includes you telling them, hey, stop. <laughs> a, a while ago, you said that Gage's collar came from Kirby Canine. Any other collar recommendations? No, not really. I'm not a big, like, collar junkie. How much Malinois blood is in Dutch Shepherds? A lot. <laughs> Some people say they're the exact same dogs. I don't find that to be the case, but for sure a lot. I have female German Shepherds. Should I go with a male to offset the BS? My next dog is coming from you. Uh, for sure, you never, ever make... I would never recommend putting uh, two of the same sex together, it's just so much possibilities for things to go wrong, you know, definitely one and one and then the other. Any other trainers closer to London you would suggest? Yeah, if you're looking for a good uh, pet obedience behavior modification trainer, uh, we have a location in Woodstock, Ontario that is run by one of my best trainers, Seema. Dog trainer Seema, you haven't received your Shield Canine merch? That is ridiculous. I'm going to hit my people up the instant I get home tomorrow and make sure you get it. Need a book from you solely on bite work and grip development. Well, no problem. That one's coming right up. I'm working on it right now. Do I have anyone in Ohio, USA? No, I don't. How much are your shirts? It depends on what shirt. You can check them out on our website, shieldcanine.ca, and you'll see all the shirts there. How do you stop barking when guests come over but still have the dog bark to alert? Well, first stop the barking, then figure out that other thing. Fundamentally, I always say with that is the quiet command. If I say be quiet, you must be quiet. doesn't mean you can't make noise. It means the second I say you be quiet, you must stop making noise. Uh, I go over in depth how to train that in my um, book and also in my online courses. So you can see that there. My male Doberman is a bully who hassles submissive dogs at the dog park. Is that fixable or is it genetic dominance? Yeah, you shouldn't be taking your dog to the dog park. Right, that shouldn't be his outlet. That shouldn't be the place that he goes. Um, I don't really need my dog to be interacting with strange dogs at all. That's not a healthy or an appropriate thing for for I think uh, your dog to be doing. It doesn't happen particularly naturally in the wild at all, right? In the wild, if you see like the dog packs tend to actually stay pretty separate. Wolves in the wild, and I don't. Oh, dogs aren't wolves. Yeah, they are. Dogs are wolves. They may not be a hundred percent the same, but guess what? They can reproduce. So genetically. Dogs are wolves, right? If something can, and, and the hybrids they produce are, are viable hybrids. It's not like a mule, right? So they are wolves, and, and wolves generally don't interact with one another freely either. It's not natural. Dogs do best only interacting with the people and dogs that are in their circle. Um, constant interaction with strangers is, is, is stressful, or your dog could be the one causing the stress, as it appears to be the case here. Will there be more videos in the future like the Doberman that worked out if defense? Maybe. 
that was a ton of information. Um, I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't, I probably won't do too many more with that level. Question for you. Would you give me your insights on my 10-month-old German Shepherd puppy's pedigree if I send it your way? Mm, not really. <laughs> the person who should give you that insight is your breeder. Um, but fundamentally, the pedigree isn't that important right now. You know, like you have the dog in front of you and you know what it is. Are you going to add an IGP tracking course or man trailing course for protection on your online academy? Yes, I am doing a tracking course. Um, I hope to use Bang as uh, my tracking dummy to show everything. Uh, I'm just trying to get the drive up right now. I meant like third generation and back. No, because it doesn't matter. Like the third generation and back in your in your pedigree does not matter, right? Like most people that show me a pedigree, the pedigree is a scatter, right? Like the dogs are all scatterbred. They're not line bred on anything. And they're like, well, my dog's great, great grandfather was this dog. It's like, who cares? You know, you know, my great, great grandfather was someone, you know, that I'm nothing like either. You know, it doesn't matter. Um, a lot of people focus on minutia that isn't important. Um, you know, so I always say just just focus on the dog in front of you. Don't worry about who's four generations back in the pedigree. And if you really want to find out, all you have to do is Google the dog's name. If it's a dog that was known, you'll see it. Hey, has huge fan. Nice to see you blowing up. Do you have any advice for people looking for a challenging pup to compete in IGP with without a reputation? How should one gain the respect of breeders? You know how you gain respect by showing up, training your dog, trialing your dog. So many people don't seem to understand that. You know, they just constantly go to seminars and talk about who they've trained with instead of what they've actually done. You know, I a lot of people in the IGP community don't like me and didn't like me and still don't like me. But you know what? A lot of them respect me now because you know what? I haven't gone away. I keep showing up. I keep trialing my dogs and I do better and better each and every time. And they know that I'm going to be around probably for another, God willing, a uh, long time. And they're going to be seeing a lot more of me. Um, I'm undeniable, right? That's how you gain respect. Uh, be undeniable, you know, and, and, and do the work. That's, that's fundamentally it. All right, guys, I'm going to check out. It was awesome talking to all of you. I had fun. I really enjoyed talking dogs with uh, people on the internet for some reason and in person, but there's more of you on the internet that want to talk about dogs and you guys want to hang in there longer than most people in person do. <laughs> Freddie, I see your question. I'm not going to answer it because those are the wrong questions to ask. This, you're thinking about your problem in terms of a tool, in terms of one thing to do. You have a holistic problem, my friend. I strongly suggest you read my book or you take my Elite Off-Leash course. Or if you don't want to do any of those things, feel free to go take someone else's course or read someone else's book. But you need a whole plan, not one thing to do because you don't have one problem. You have a holistic problem, my friend. It's not, there's no one color that's going to fix your problem. There's no one method that's going to fix your problem. There's an amalgamation of things that you need to do with your dog in order to get him or her where you want them to be.